Dynamite Kid is one of the most influential in-ring performers in pro wrestling history. He wanted to be the best wrestler he could be, and he wanted to be known for his ability in a ring. His work during the early 1980s is legendary and is a must-see for anyone who wants to learn more about pro wrestling history. His New Japan Pro Wrestling feud with the first Tiger Mask, Satoru Sayama, is one of the most important series not only in Japanese pro wrestling history, but all of pro wrestling history. Those matches were so ahead of their time that they changed everyone's perception of what pro wrestling could be like. The athleticism displayed in those matches was top notch and inspired future generations of pro wrestlers. Tom Bellington was born on December 5, 1958 in Goulburn, England. When his father introduced him to former wrestler Ted Betley, Billington started training at Batley's gym and learned how to wrestle. Batley ended up taking Billington to Billy Riley's gym, which was known as the Snake Pit. Riley had trained catch wrestlers like Billy Robinson and Carl Gotch. Catch was an essential part of Billington's training, but Batley didn't like the way Billington was treated at Riley's gym. So Batley started bringing Billington to a different gym. This time it was the gym of Billy Chambers, also known as Jack Fallon. Billington, under the name Dynamite Kid, made his pro wrestling debut on December 24, 1975, in Malvern Wells, England. He was a talented young wrestler with a bright future ahead of him. His speed and agility made him stand out during the first 10 years of his career. Stu Hart was a promoter of a league called Stampede Wrestling in Western Canada, which mainly ran shows in Alberta and Saskatchewan. One of his sons, Bruce Hart, was on a tour in England during the fall of 1977 and saw Dynamite Kit wrestle. Bruce was very impressed and wanted to bring Dynamite in for a Stampede wrestling tour, but Dynamite initially turned the offer down. However, after a disagreement with the promoter of joint promotions in England, which was the league featured on World of Sports, Dynamite decided to accept Bruce's offer. On April 27, 1978, with 20 British pounds sterling in his pocket, Dynamite left England for Calgary, Alberta, Canada. He was going for a six-week tour, but Canada ended up being his home for the next 13 years. On April 28, 1978, Dynamite Kid had his first match for Stampede Wrestling in Calgary. He would be a regular name for Stampede for the next six years. Stampede was traditionally a territory where bigger wrestlers had been on top, and promoter Stu was initially apprehensive about bringing in a smaller guy like Dynamite, but Bruce convinced Stu to give Dynamite a chance. Stampede was struggling at the time and Stu was even thinking about selling the company. However, Dynamite not only managed to get himself over, but also showed that junior heavyweight wrestlers could be drawing people to shows. And on top of that, Dynamite basically turned business around to the point that Stampede ended up having some very successful years. Soon after Dynamite had arrived, Stampede started pushing their mid-heavyweight division more because they knew it would be good for business to push Dynamite more. In July 1979, Dynamite would make his first tour to Japan for the IWE, International Wrestling Enterprise, after Mr. Hito asked him if he would be interested in working in Japan. Along with Kazuo Sakurada, Mr. Hito was one of the main trainers in Stu Hart's dungeon and a regular for Stampede Wrestling. Mr. Hito and Sakurada were also two of the main trainers of Bret Hart, who would arguably end up becoming the most well-known member of the Hart family. Mr. Hito explained to Dynamite that working a Japanese tour was a good opportunity to get exposure in Japan and that more promoters would be interested in him. Also in the summer of 79, Dynamite's life would change when American wrestler Sylvester Ritter, also known as Junkyard Dog, would introduce Dynamite to steroids. This would have a big impact on his career and life, initially perhaps in somewhat of a positive way, but eventually in quite a negative way. Dynamite wrestled a couple of extensive tours in Germany, one in the summer of 78 and one in the summer of 79. Dynamite certainly was a well-traveled wrestler who had the opportunity to go on international tours on a regular basis. Stu changed his Japanese business relationship from IWE to New Japan. This resulted in Tatsumi Fujinami coming to Calgary to wrestle Dynamite Kid on August 17, 1979. This match between Dynamite and Fujinami was probably Dynamite's best match up until that point in his career. Luckily, there was a Japanese crew filming that day, 
and that's why we have this match available in full form, as the Canadian TV version is incomplete. Even though most Stampede Wrestling footage that is available are only the last few minutes of their matches, because the matches were edited to fit a one-hour TV show, watching Dynamite's matches from Stampede still helps piece together the pieces of the puzzle when researching his career. His input was great, but he rarely had an opponent that was on the level of Fujinami and Stampede. To say that Bruce and Keith Hart aren't exactly Sayama and Fujinami would be an understatement. Regardless of all of that, it is clear that Dynamite was a worker who gave strong performances on a regular basis, and he elevated the overall quality of the territory from a business and especially an in-ring work perspective. From 1980 through mid-1984, Dynamite would tour New Japan on a regular basis. This era was also the peak era of his career as an in-ring performer. He stood out as a worker who was able to innovate and combine styles of British, North American and Japanese wrestling. He had a great match against Tatsumi Fujinami on February 5, 1980 at a New Japan show. Also in 1980, Dynamite made his first appearances in the United States as he wrestled in Hawaii and Montana. In 1981, Dynamite Kid showed how versatile he was by giving memorable performances in Canada, Japan and England against a variety of opponents. It was also the year the legendary feud started with the first Tiger Mask. Their first match together was on April 23, 1981 in New Japan. It was an excellent start to one of the most influential feuds in wrestling. In May 1981, Davy Boy started wrestling for Stampede. Davy Boy was Dynamite's first cousin. Dynamite's father was the brother of Davy Boy's mother. And Davy Boy, who had come over from England, was eager to step into footsteps of Dynamite. Even though they were family, Dynamite didn't like Davy Boy too much, and they weren't too close. But in the ring, they had very good chemistry as workers. First they were opponents, and later they became a tag team that would become famously known as the British Bulldogs. In 1982, the feud between Dynamite and Sayama continued. Dynamite and Sayama were arguably the two very best workers in the world at the time. Sayama had toured Mexico and England. As a result of those international tours, Sayama had incorporated aspects of Mexican wrestling and British wrestling into his style. This resulted in the legendary matches between Dynamite and Sayama having elements of British, Northern American, Japanese and Mexican wrestling influences. In other words, Dynamite and Sayama basically created a wrestling style for the future. August 1982 was a particularly eventful month for Dynamite Kid. After having a great match against each other on August 5th, 1982 in Tokyo, that same month Dynamite vs. Sayama took place at Madison Square Garden in New York City. This was on August 30th, 1982, and it was the first time working at Madison Square Garden for both these wrestlers. The next day Dynamite went to Portland, Oregon for a tour to wrestle in the Pacific Northwest Wrestling Territory. He spent the rest of the year and the beginning of the next year mostly in the Calgary area. In April 1983, Dynamite returned to Japan for a tour with New Japan. On this tour, one of his opponents was once again Sayama. The two had a great match on April 21st, 1983. This match, along with their August 5th, 1982 match, is among the most legendary junior heavyweight matches ever. Once again, Dynamite and Sayama put on an amazing display that inspired and influenced future generations of wrestlers. In June 1983, Dynamite Kit returned to the PNW territory. He played a big role in the territory and joined Rip Oliver's heel stable known as the Clan. He even held the NWA Pacific Northwest heavyweight title for a month. Since Portland wasn't too far from his home in Calgary, Dynamite was able to appear in PNW regularly from June 1983 through December 1983. His main opponents in PNW were Kurt Hennig, Buddy Rose, and Billy Jack Haynes. Despite being a junior heavyweight wrestler for most of his career, Dynamite showed that a top junior heavyweight can potentially hang in there with the heavyweights. Dynamite's intensity, versatility, and overall ability made him credible against wrestlers larger than him. Dynamite had quite a successful career in New Japan from early 1980 through mid-1984. 
but Dynamite felt that things weren't the same in New Japan once Sayama had left New Japan in the summer of 83 because of Sayama being dissatisfied with the company's backstage politics. In 1984, Sayama became part of the UWF, the first truth style league. Supposedly, Sayama even asked Dynamite if he would like to join the UWF, but Dynamite didn't think the league would last. At some point in the summer of 84, Dynamite Kid was contacted by All Japan Pro Wrestling, and they made him a good offer. All Japan was the rival of New Japan, but Dynamite decided to jump to All Japan anyway. This was a huge deal at the time, not only because of the rivalry between the two leagues, but also because New Japan had a working relationship with Stampede and WWF. Dynamite made not only New Japan, but also Stampede and WWF very upset by jumping from New Japan to All Japan. Dynamite didn't really care about that because he felt that any other wrestler would have done the same since he was offered a good extra amount of money and part of it was guaranteed. And he was given the option of picking any tours he wanted to work. All Japan promoter Giant Baba was at least willing to honor New Japan's request of not showing Dynamite's matches from 1984 as part of the media blackout, perhaps in an attempt by Antonio Inoki's New Japan to hide from the fans that quite a few wrestlers had jumped ship at the time. Dynamite participated in All Japan's annual tag team tournament in late 1984. Dynamite returned to All Japan for three tours in 1985. During the second tour, he won the NWA International Junior Heavyweight title when he beat Mighty Inoue in All Japan on June 8, 1985. Five days later, Dynamite would lose the title to Kuniaki Kobayashi. As mentioned before, Dynamite had wrestled in New York on August 30th, 1982 when he faced Sayama at Madison Square Garden. That was just a one-off and not a regular thing for Dynamite at the time. The match took place because New Japan had a working relationship with WWF. However, from August 29th, 1984, Dynamite would start working more often in the northeast of North America. You see, this organization called WWF was run by a promoter called Vince McMahon and he was trying to take over the wrestling world and turn it into a sports entertainment industry. WWF started as a regional territory in the northeast of North America, in the New York area under Vince's father, Vince McMahon Sr. However, after Junior took over, they slowly started invading other territories and running other promoters out of business. Instead of trying to run Stampede out of business, McMahon offered Stu to buy him out in order to start running shows in Western Canada. Stu and McMahon came to an agreement. Also part of the deal was that McMahon would start booking Bret Hart, Dynamite Kid, and Davy Boy Smith, who were Stu's top three guys. WWF would later end up hiring more wrestlers that at some point had come through Stampede. The final card of Stampede would take place in the fall of 84, until they would eventually start up again a year later. Dynamite team with Bret Hart in Bret's first WWF match on August 29, 1984, at a WWF TV taping in Brantford, Ontario, Canada. Dynamite was impressive and worked unlike anyone else in the WWF at the time. The second time Dynamite wrestled at a WWF TV taping in 84 was in Poughkeepsie, New York on September 11, 1984. The remainder of September and also in October, Dynamite appeared on some WWF shows in Ontario. Dynamite told Big Man that Davy Boy Smith, who started getting booked by WWF in late September of 84, was his first cousin and that they were both from England. This gave McMahon the idea to call them the British Bulldogs. In November, WWF finally started running a few shows in Western Canada, which was traditionally Stampede Wrestling territory. As a result, WWF didn't draw well in that area as the fans were used to Stampede and not the less serious product WWF was trying to spread everywhere. Because of that, McMahon wanted out of his deal with Stu, and Stampede will be able to start again in October of 1985. From March of 1985, Dynamite Kid had started wrestling even more often for WWF, and now not just in the Northeast, but also in different areas, as the WWF was expanding. On September 14, 1985, Dynamite wrestled a pretty good match against Bret Hart in Landover, Maryland. Most of Dynamite's matches while working for this league aren't noteworthy, though. The British Bulldogs versus the Hart Foundation, Bret Hart and Jim Neidhart, was a feud that resulted in matches that should definitely be considered really good for the standards of the WWF circus, but not something that stands out in the bigger picture of things. 
especially when compared to Dynamite's work in Japan. Just like in Calgary, it was through his matches with Dynamite in WWF that Brett got to show his true potential. WWF was expanding, and so was the physique of Dynamite and Davy Boy, who had become less flexible and clearly way too roided by mid-1985. In November of 1985, Dynamite wrestled a few matches for Stampede. He'd also wrestle a tour for All Japan and take part in the annual tag team tournament later that year. WWF had been trying to sign the Bullocks, but Dynamite would keep refusing because he wanted to keep touring Japan. However, WWF finally managed to convince Dynamite as they promised that the Bulldogs would get the tag titles on April 7, 1986 at WrestleMania 2. Unfortunately, this meant no more Japan for the Bulldogs. On December 13, 1986, at a house show at Cops Coliseum in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada, Dynamite suffered a severe back injury that almost ended his career. It was not necessarily something that specifically happened during the match that caused the injury, but it was years of bumping, high-risk moves, and steroids that culminated in nearly a career-ending situation. In 1987 and 1988, after returning from the severe back injury, he was clearly not the worker he once was. In January of 1987, Dynamite wasn't even able to walk without assistance, but he showed up and took part in a short match that saw the Bulldogs drop the title to the Hart Foundation. The Bulldogs weren't pushed that much by the fall of 1988, and a physical altercation with Jacques Rougeau that happened backstage also didn't help. It was time for Dynamite to leave the circus, and Dynamite's last match for WWF took place on November 24, 1988 at the second annual Survivor Series. Unfortunately, along with physically not being the same wrestler he was in the early 1980s, Dynamite's moveset only started getting increasingly smaller from the mid-1980s onwards. In addition to his work having become increasingly more inconsistent from 1984 onward. To his credit, he always seemed to give a good effort, but it seemed that his effort and what his body was able to do were no longer matching up as the years went on. First, it was the roids making him less mobile, then it was the injuries limiting his ability, and then it was also getting used to work repetitive matches against opponents of lesser quality in the WWF. Dynamite and Davy Boy finally returned to Stampede in late 1988. Also, finally it was time to tour Old Japan again in early 1989. Dynamite was certainly not the wrestler he was in the early 80s, but he could still go during 1989, and he managed to make good contributions to many of his matches. The fact that he had now left WWF also seemed to have given him some extra motivation again. At some point during his return to Stampede, Dynamite was the booker for a few weeks. During the spring and summer of 1989, Dynamite would make a few appearances in Atlantic Grand Prix Wrestling in Eastern Canada. During the 1990s, he was physically such a broken wreck that he could no longer really live up to his reputation. Still, he was respected, and he still continued to tour all Japan. In 1991, in a full circle type situation, Dynamite moved back to England with the same amount of money he had left England with, 20 British pounds. The last couple of tours for all Japan were rough, on one particular tour, Dynamite looked so ill that Giant Baba forced Dynamite to take the day off. Dynamite decided to retire from Japanese pro wrestling in December 1991. Dynamite continued to wrestle in the British independent scene, which wasn't thriving by any means during the 1990s. Dynamite was invited to watch some matches at ringside at an All Japan show on February 28, 1993. Dynamite didn't have too much money at the time, and that's why he accepted All Japan's request to return to the ring in Japan for a couple of matches in July 1993. There's also some handheld footage available of some of Dynamite's matches in England in late 1993, but his 1983 matches were all quite average and certainly not recommended viewing. After having wrestled approximately 2,000 pro wrestling matches and more than 300 different opponents during a career that had started in 1975, Dynamite Kit retired after working his final match on October 10th, 1996 in Tokyo, Japan. He was barely able to wrestle by that point and it was clear for everyone that this would really be his last match. It was a match for Michinoku Pro and he wrestled in a Legends six-man tag team match. One of his opponents in his final match was his favorite opponent, Satoru Sayama. In 1997, Dynamite would end up in a wheelchair as a result of all the suffering his body had gone through over the years. Injuries, bumps, high-risk moves, 
steroids, and other drugs. In 1999, Dynamite's book Pure Dynamite, the autobiography of Tom Dynamite Kid Billington, was released. In this book, he was not only sharing interesting stories about his wrestling career, but he was also honest about his drug usage and some of the terrible pranks he pulled on other wrestlers. Regardless of what people thought of him as a human being, he was a great pro wrestler. Even though some feel that he came across as bitter in his book, Dynamite said that if he would have had the chance to do it all over again, he'd do everything the same. Dynamite said, wrestling was my life and I loved it. No regrets. I had a blast. Dynamite Kid was interviewed a few times in the 2010s. He was told that many Japanese fans still believe that the matches he had with Sayama are the best matches ever. Dynamite said that it made him happy to hear that. After his health had kept declining, Tom Billington died in Wigan, England on December 5th, 2018, which was also the day of his 60th birthday. Dynamite Kid's influence on professional wrestling really is immeasurably great. When you watch his matches from his prime, it becomes clear how much of an influence he was to other wrestlers and to stylistic changes in pro wrestling all over the world. Those wrestlers may or may not have been directly influenced by his famous series of matches with Satoru Sayama and or Dynamite's work in general, because sometimes they were possibly influenced by his work without even knowing it, since Dynamite's influence was much like a ripple effect. A large number of wrestlers, especially those who came through the Calgary Territory and or the New Japan Junior Heavyweight Division, were clearly influenced by Dynamite's work, either directly or indirectly. In particular, Dynamite's series of matches with Sayama was a huge influence on the Japanese Junior Heavyweight Wrestling scene and subsequently all of modern pro wrestling. The list of wrestlers who are influenced by Dynamite is pretty much endless. But just to name a few of the wrestlers who appear to have been influenced significantly by his work are wrestlers like Bret Hart, Davey Boy Smith, Chris Benoit, Owen Hart, K.G. Yamada, Ben Bazarab, Biff Wellington, Johnny Smith, Bret Como, Tsuyoshi Kikuchi, Sean Waltman, Rey Mysterio Jr., Chris Jericho, Lance Storm, Psychosis, Davey Boy Smith Jr., Brian Danielson, Prince Devitt, Pac, Davey Richards, Kyle O'Reilly, Tyler Bate, and Dynamite's nephews to Billington Bulldogs, Thomas Billington and Mark Billington, etc., etc. Dynamite Kit certainly deserves a spot in the Hall of Talent. My overall conclusion of Dynamite Kit's career is as follows. In 1976, he was decent. He was still learning at the time. In 1977 and 1978, he was good. He showed significant improvement during that period. In 1979, he was very good. After showing great potential earlier, Dynamite Kit really started becoming very good in 1979, and this was also when he started wrestling in Japan. In 1980, he was excellent. This is when he started appearing in New Japan Pro Wrestling. In 1981, he was great. He kept becoming more and more amazing around this time. In 1982, he was an all-time great. His work from 1982 is legendary, especially his work against Sayama. In 1983, he was great. He was still great and he had one of the best matches ever on April 21st, 1983 against Sayama. In 1984 and 1985, he was very good. He became more inconsistent and he started slowing down due to excessive steroid usage. However, he was still able to add explosiveness to his matches. In 1986, he was good. He was still good, but he had become a very repetitive WWF worker. In 1987 and 1988, he was decent. His work really was never the same after getting severely injured in December of 1986. In 1989, he was good. He actually improved a bit in 1989 because of him starting to work in Japan again, which seemed to motivate him quite a bit, and he was facing better opponents again. In 1990 and 1991, he was decent. During the 1990s, he was too broken down physically to perform at the level he used to perform at. After he came back from his original retirement in 1991, he was average at best. For example, he was just average in 1993 and below average in 1996 before he eventually retired on October 10th, 1996. So Dynamite's peak was definitely the early 1980s and he gave 
tremendous performances in Japan during this time period. Dynamite's work in Canada and England was also top-notch around that time. He was one of the very best workers in the world during the early 1980s, arguably the best. Satoru Sayama, Tatsumi Fujinami, Mark Rocco, and Marty Jones were among the best opponents Dynamite wrestled during his career. He was tenacious, rugged, and vicious. Even though he was an incredible worker during his relatively short in-ring peak, what perhaps stands out the most about Dynamite is that he's absolutely one of the most influential wrestlers ever. His work, in particular his matches against Sayama, influenced a countless number of wrestlers. In recent times, it has become somewhat normal to see spectacular junior heavyweight matches, but Dynamite was one of the pioneers in an era that mostly had slower heavyweight matches on top of the cards. Dynamite's in-ring work helped people in the wrestling business to start thinking more outside the box. In the end, Dynamite should certainly be considered one of the 20 greatest men's pro wrestlers of all time, and maybe even one of the top 10. Here is a list of Dynamite Kid's 15 best matches.